Our next speaker is John Gee. John Gee is the William Bill Gay Research Professor in the Department of Asian and Near Eastern Languages at Brigham Young University. He's published, published dozens of scholarly articles and five books, including the introduction to the Book of Abraham. And when they say dozens of articles, I've actually seen his, his CV, his, and it's, uh, it's a lot. He's published a lot. He's very prolific in what he does. So with that, we'll turn our time over to John Key. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, at some point, we'll see if the uh, if I'm plagued by the same technical glitches as everyone else has been. Um, uh, I've had to cut my talk in half to fit the allotted time. And those who are interested in the full version may consult the printed version in Dan Peterson's Feshrift. Now I'd like to explore the idea expressed by President Joseph F. Smith in 1901 that those who have made a covenant with God by sacrifice will defend the cause of Zion. President Smith called doing so a privilege and promised that those who defended the cause of Zion would enjoy greater, uh, a greater outpouring of the Lord's Spirit than we have ever enjoyed and they would live nearer to the Lord. For Latter-day Saints, both of these blessings are desirable, and they know that when we obtain any blessing from God, it is by obedience to that law upon which it is predicated. President Smith knew something about what it meant to defend the cause of Zion by their example as well as by their, by their professions, and about some of the costs associated with doing so. Returning home from his first mission to Hawaii late in 1857 or early 1858, immediately after the Mountain Meadows Massacre, when tensions were high and Johnson's army was on the way to Utah, 19-year-old Joseph F. Smith demonstrated that he was willing to sacrifice even his own life if necessary. Returning to camp one day, his arms loaded with firewood, he encountered a band of ruffians. One of them declared that it was his duty to exterminate every Mormon he should meet, stuck a gun in Elder Smith's face and asked, are you a Mormon? Elder Smith answered, yes siree, dyed in the wool, true blue, through and through. Elder Smith fully expected to receive the charge of the man's pistol, but the answer took the man so aback that he shook Elder Smith's hand and declared, I am glad to see a man that stands up for his conviction. Joseph F. Smith was following the example of his father, Hiram Smith, one of the witnesses of the Book of Mormon who eventually did give his life for what he believed. The early Latter-day Saints saw it as a duty to defend themselves through the press, writing and publishing things that defended their beliefs. They had scriptural precedents for that, for they had been commanded to gather up the libelous publications, oops, uh, the libelous publications that are afloat and present the whole concatenation of diabolical rascality and nefarious and murderous impositions that have been practiced upon this people. They may publish it to all the world. The saints have often treated this command lightly, yet we are assured that these things should be attended to with great earnestness. Let no man count them as small things, for there is much that lieth in futurity pertaining to the saints which depends upon these things. Besides these modern injunctions, there is a clear ancient commandment. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you, as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. This scripture has been cited many times in connection with defending the church. Uh, it was, at least in the printed discourses, this may be wrong, uh, a favorite of Brigham Young who cited it 29 times in his printed discourses. But for about 60 years, it was not cited in general conference until its use was revived by Harold B. Lee in response to, quote, the doubts and the vain philosophies in the minds of some of our young people. President Dallin H. Oaks cited the scripture in connection with the covenants of the sacrament. 
We also take upon us the name of Jesus Christ whenever we publicly proclaim our belief in him. Each of us has many opportunities to proclaim our belief to friends and neighbors, fellow workers, and casual acquaintances. As the Pro Apostle Peter taught the saints of his day, we should sanctify the Lord God in our hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh us a reason of the hope that is in us. Thus, according to President Oaks, defending the kingdom of God is implicit in the covenants of the sacrament that church members make each Sunday. It is also echoed in the baptismal covenant to stand as witnesses of God at all times and in all things and in all places that ye may be in, even until death, that ye may be redeemed of God and be numbered of, with those of the first resurrection, that ye may have eternal life. Elder Boyd K. Packer addressed the issue of covenants to defend the kingdom of God in an address that was and still is much reviled among intellectuals of the church. Oops, there's our Mosiah scripture. In the church, we are not neutral. We are one-sided. There is a war going on and we are engaged in it. It is the war between good and evil and we are belligerents defending the good. We are therefore obliged to give preference to and protect all that is represented in the gospel of Jesus Christ and we have made covenants to do it. Elder Packer saw a covenant obligation to protect the gospel in the church. Packer noted that there was or should be a distinction between Latter-day Saint scholars and other scholars. Commenting on an associate he had who resisted pressure from his graduate advisors to present a secular view of the church, he noted that scholars who are not members of the church, oops, wrong way, do not know the things of the spirit. One can understand their position. It is another thing, however, when we consider members of the church, particularly those who hold the priesthood and have made covenants in the temple. Many do not do as my associate did. Rather, they capitulate, cross over the line, and forsake the things of the spirit. Thereafter, they judge the church, the doctrine, and the leadership by the standards of their academic profession. According to Elder Packer, disciples of Jesus Christ should not adopt the standards of their academic profession as a lens through which one to examine or judge the church. Elder Packer continued, one who chooses to follow the tenets of his profession regardless of how they may enter the church or destroy the faith of those not ready for advanced history is himself in spiritual jeopardy. If that one is a member of the church, he has broken his covenants and it will be accountable. After all of the tomorrows of mortalities have been finished, he will not stand where he might have stood. Those who keep their covenants will judge the world by the gospel of Jesus Christ and not the other way around. Those who prefer the tenets of their profession to the detriment of faith have broken their covenants. He makes an even starker claim. Those of you who are employed by the church have a special responsibility to build faith, not destroy it. If you do not do that, but in fact accommodate the enemy who is the destroyer of faith, you become in that sense a traitor to the cause you have made covenants to protect. As Elder Packer lays the issue out, many individuals in the church have made covenants to protect the church. Those who are employed by the church should build faith. Among the expressions in the Brigham Young University mission statement is the following statement. In meeting these objectives, objectives BYU's faculty, staff, students, and administrators should also be anxious to make their service and scholarship available to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in furthering its work worldwide. According to the mission statement, it is incumbent upon all administration, faculty, staff, and students to use their scholarship in furthering the work of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. It should be available to build and defend the kingdom of God. This is the one requirement of the BYU mission statement that is explicitly shared by BYU's faculty, staff, students, and administrators. In 1998, when the Foundation for Ancient Research and Mormon Studies was brought into Brigham Young University, it was brought in, according to President Gordon B. Hinckley, to provide strong support and defense of the church on a professional basis. President Hinckley saw a bright future for this effort now through the, the university. For President Hinckley, the defense of the church on a professional basis was something that Brigham Young University should be doing. Arguably, this is part of BYU's mission. In 2004, 
Elder Maxwell, in his last talk to an audience at BYU, compared the need of B for BYU professors to defend the kingdom to those who built the Temple of Nauvoo. In a way, LDS scholars at BYU and elsewhere are a little bit like the builders of the temple in Nauvoo, who worked with a trowel in one hand and a musket in the other. Today's scholars building the temple of learning must also pause on occasion to defend the kingdom. I personally think this is one of the Lord reasons the Lord established and maintains this university. The dual role of builder and defender is unique and ongoing. I am grateful we have scholars today who could handle, as it were, both trowels and muskets. This passage has since been quoted by President Oaks in 2014, President Oaks in 2017, and Elder Jeffrey R. Holland in 2021. President Oaks expounded in a talk on the challenges to the mission of Brigham Young University that, in my leadership conference message of August 2014, I encouraged BYU faculty to offer public, unassigned support of church policies that others were challenging on secular grounds. Note the word unassigned. The church should not have to ask or assign. The duty is inherent in the position. Offering public unassigned support or making their service and scholarship available to the church is inherent in both the faculty position and the mission statement of BYU. Not providing it, President Oaks saw as a challenge to BYU's mission. To emphasize this point, he added the following comment in both addresses. I would like to hear a little more musket fire from this temple of learning, especially on the subject of the fundamental doctrine and policies of the family. Since our members should be defenders of marriage, is a union of a man and a woman, as Elder Nelson taught in his 2014 BYU commencement address, we should expect our teachers to be outspoken on that subject. Apparently, President Oaks did not feel that the BYU administration's faculty and staff were providing enough public support, either assigned or unassigned, to the church. It does not seem that President Oaks, then on the Board of Trustees of the University, thought that fulfilling the other objectives of the mission statement was sufficient. The statement he referred to then was uh, President Russell M. Nelson's address to BYU graduates, the disciples of our Lord are defenders of marriage. We cannot yield. History is not our judge. Secular society is not our judge. God is our judge. In 2015, the First Presidency sent the following statement to every faculty and staff member at BYU. The auditors of tomorrow, when they study the balance sheets of Brigham Young University, are not alone going to be satisfied with how well you fit into business, but they are going to ask one more pertinent question. Have we developed staunch defenders of the faith of the church? It is much easier to develop students who are staunch defenders of the faith if faculty are staunch defenders of the faith themselves. It is also easier for faculty to staunchly defend the faith if administrators first set the example. The duty is inherent in the position. Whether anyone at Brigham Young University paid any attention to this is an open question. It is apparent that the First Presidency did want some of these instructions put into practice because on the 12th of June, 2019, they issued guidelines to those involved in religious education throughout the church education system that stated that one of the purposes of religious education is to teach the, go the restored gospel of Jesus Christ from the scriptures and modern prophets in a way that helps each, each student strengthen their ability to find answers, resolve doubts, respond with faith, and give reasons for that faith to others, or sorry, and give reason for the hope within them in whatsoever challenges they may face. The First Presidency here breaks down the task of developing staunch defenders of the faith into teaching students to find answers for themselves, resolve their own doubts, respond with faith to challenges, and give reasons for that faith to others. Becoming a staunch defender of the faith is an expectation of every student at every church institution of higher education, and it is a duty inherent in the position of every administrator, faculty, and staff member at those institutions to teach the students by word and deed to do so. In 2018, in the first public address scolding a campus entity in over a third of a century that he said he hoped will apply across the entire campus and beyond, Elder Holland said, we ask you as a part of a larger game plan to keep 
always keep a scholarly hand fully in the face of those who oppose us. He said that the brethren want those at Brigham Young University to contribute that to that defense with solid, reputable scholarship intended as much for everyday garden variety Latter-day Saints who want their faith bolstered at least as much as it might be intended for disinterested academic colleagues across the countries whose status purpose will never be to prove or disprove the truth claims of the church. Uh, the university's community's response has on the whole been muted. One would have thought that with the same explicit request coming from the university's board of trustees at least seven times in an eight year period that the university would have paid more attention. Unsurprisingly, the idea of defending the church or even supporting the church does not all appeal to all intellectuals within the church. Uh, one opponent to this approach uh, is Benjamin Park. Benjamin Park, Park raised the, praised the new Mor Mormon history, which he sees as a successful attempt to use the tools of the broader academy to help understand the Mormon tradition and an earlier version of Mormon studies. Park thus sees the new Mormon history, much as Elder Packer did, as an attempt to judge the church, the doctrine, and its leadership by the standards of their academic profession. Where Park naively sees this as a good thing, Packer foresaw potential problems. Where Park sees the effort as successful, Packer warned that there is no such thing as an accurate, objective history of the church without consideration of the spiritual powers that attend this work. According to Packer, any attempt to use only the tools of the broader academy is neither accurate nor objective. It is not a success, it is a failure. Park maintains that America has long found cultural power and fascination in the Mormon tradition, and the Mormon studies community has finally developed the intellectual resources and discursive tools required to quench that thirst. But Park also notes that what is arguably the culmination of the new Mormon history, Richard Bushman's rough stone rolling, failed to gain widespread acceptance among those outside the faith while alienating some in the faith. It quenched neither the thirst to explain Joseph Smith away, nor the thirst to bolster faith. If the Mormon studies community really did have the intellectual resources and tools to quench either thirst, it has failed to demonstrate them. For Park, the goal of Mormon studies is to show that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is merely an embodiment for broader cultural and religious tensions and not unique in any way. For Packer, this would count as a failure. Perhaps this difference in viewpoint is one reason why Park wants to distinguish what he would like to do and what Elder Packer asks individuals to do. Park invokes Jefferson's metaphor of a wall between church and state to argue that, quote, Mormon scholarship is much healthier when there is a clear separation between Mormon studies and Mormon apologetics, close quote. A requisite of Mormon studies is that one needs to check one's religion at the door. That may or may not work as scholarship. Packer and Park would disagree on that point. But it does not work as discipleship. As Elder Holland put it, lesson number one for the establishment of Zion in the 21st century, you never check your religion at the door, not ever. My young friends, that kind of discipleship cannot be. It isn't discipleship at all. Park's request has corollaries that need to be made explicit. The first is that the wall between Mormon studies and those who defend the church implies that there is a wall, an inseparable wall between Mormon studies and those who keep their covenants. Those who keep their covenants are excluded from Mormon studies and are not welcome there at the insistence of those who do Mormon studies. This in turn means as a second corollary that those who do not do Mormon studies do not keep their covenants. Packer would have at least agreed in part with Park since he stated that one who chooses to follow the tenets of his profession, regardless of how they may injure the church or destroy the faith, has broken his covenants. <coughs> Park and Packer agree about what the new Mormon history and its successor Mormon studies are doing. They also agree that the approach of both is a rejection of covenants. Where they differ is whether this is either good or desirable. 
The goal of Mormon studies, according to Kathleen Flake, is to make a living by thinking about all things LDS. Spencer Flumans saw the goal differently. For him, the goal or guiding principle of Mormon studies was friendship. That is, intellectual good society and the friendship forge across boundaries that defines it. The boundaries to which he refers are the boundaries within and around a religion and those who study it. In this, he agrees with Hugh Nibley, who saw the goals of such endeavors as gaining the respect and recognition and professional camaraderie of the experts outside the church. As President Oaks pointed out years ago, the scriptures have a word for gospel service for the sake of, oops, have a word for gospel service for the sake of riches and honors. It is priestcraft. Nephi says priestcrafts are that men preach and set themselves up for a light unto the world that they may get gain and the praise of the world, but they seek not the welfare of Zion. As the stories of Joseph F. Smith and Hiram Smith illustrate, defending the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints may come at a cost. There may be a sacrifice involved. In their case, it was the willingness to sacrifice even their lives if necessary, which in Hiram's case it was. In most cases, the sacrifice is not as drastic. As Park and Fluman have laid out, if one keeps one's covenants, one can certainly expect to sacrifice friendship, respect, recognition, professional camaraderie, or even as being viewed as a scholar or even being involved in scholarship. Those involved in defending the church and kingdom of God are certainly familiar with those sacrifices. Sacrifices of respect and recognition will not come easily to those whose hearts are set on the honors of men. Their goal is to be seen as honorable. But the honorable men and women of the earth receive a terrestrial reward and not the celestial reward of those who are valiant in the testimony of Jesus. Elder Maxwell noted that there, that what so many honorable individuals do is certainly useful and even commendable, but their focus is not on the celestial. I hope you will not settle for being among the honorable men and women of the earth. It can also be difficult to achieve a terrestrial goal by telestial means. Um, I need to cut even more. Um, so, at one point in time, there was a situation at BYU where donors sacrificed their means and scholars sacrificed their time, talents, and reputations to defend the church. That situation ended when certain individuals were no longer willing to make those kind of sacrifices. Those sacrifices, however, one must still be willing to make if they wish to keep their covenants, even if no one wants it to come to that. If, however, our covenants are getting in the way of what we are trying to do, then obviously, obviously we are trying to do the wrong thing. There are other consequences that come with the neglect of covenants. Elder Packard issued a solemn warning on the subject. Do I have this one? Nope. Skip that one. I want to say in all seriousness that there is a limit to the patience of the Lord with respect to those who are under covenant to bless and protect his church and kingdom on, upon earth, but do not do it. Um, okay, I've got a great quote by Elder Maxwell, but you'll have to read that one. Um, He talks about holding back and how scholars hold back. Well, faculty, staff, students, and administrators who do not make their service and scholarship available to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in furthering its work world worldwide are arguably holding something back. Perhaps, too, they are holding themselves back from certain promised blessing that would come if they were dyed in the wool, true blue, through and through. President Kimball told the BYU community that he was both hopeful and expectant that out of this university and the church education system, there will rise brilliant stars in drama, literature, music, sculpture, painting, science, and all the scholarly graces. <coughs> we may have been expectant that those brilliant stars might arise, that might arise from BYU would receive the recognition and accolades of the secular world. There may be some of those. 
But as saints whom Jesus prophesied would be hated in the world, we cannot expect that any brilliant stars will necessarily receive the praise of the world. We may in find the, instead find that those brilliant stars appears as their work is consecrated to make their service and scholarship available to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and furthering its work in worldwide. It may be that the sacrifice we're called to do is popularity. Thank you very much.